Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you stop comparing and start living. I'm your host, Heather Creekmore. I hate to admit this, but I used to secretly obsess over my appearance. I thought it was part of my job as a woman to always look better, but never felt like I could be good enough. Maybe you can relate. But God, in His grace, He showed me a way out, and I want to give you all the tools you need to break free, too. If you've ever spent too much time stressing over your looks, I get it. I hope you'll keep listening and find the same freedom I have. Here are three other things you need to know about me. I'm a minivan driving mom of four elementary age kids. I'm author of the book Compared to Who and a blogger at comparedtowho.me. And you just may have seen my epic bake fail on Netflix. If you've ever struggled with comparison or body image issues, Compared to Who is the show for you. I hope you enjoy today's episode and tell a friend about it. Hey there, I'm Heather Creekmore and I am so glad you're listening today because in today's episode, we're going to talk about how to stop troubleshooting your life and how to start living. Now that might be a little vague at first, but trust me, if you're a perfectionist or you tend to stress about every little thing in your life and how it could be better or how you could do better or what you could have said better, this episode is for you. So my first question for you today is this. Do you tend to obsess over what went wrong and how to make sure everything goes right or better the next time? Do you tell yourself things like, you're just learning from your mistakes, but do you secretly feel like you should never have made a mistake in the first place? Maybe your goal in life is to have all of your ducks in a row, but you find out that reality is ducks do their own thing and getting them all to stand still in a straight line is never going to happen. Something's always moving, changing, or quacking. Well, I want you to consider today's episode as your audio reminder to stop troubleshooting your life and find rest. Now, by troubleshooting, I mean stop focusing on all the little things in your life that you could improve or make better and find contentment. I was thinking about how when there's a problem with our computers, we call tech support and they quote unquote troubleshoot until they find the problem. Most of the time, the problems we call about to troubleshoot are problems that can stop us from making progress, right? I can't use my computer or I can't print, so I'm going to get some help to fix that part of it so I can use it again. But some of us are programmed to see the holes in life. It's just our natural bent. We are natural born problem finders and in many cases, problem solvers. And though that works really well in some environments and could even serve you really well in your career if you're in, say, risk management or even an editor, but it may not serve you so well in life. How foolish would it be to never use your computer again because you are constantly troubleshooting every little thing that's wrong with it? And yet, friend, I think there are women and men out there who spend so much time troubleshooting their lives that they miss out on living it. So I was at the nail salon this week using a gift card that I got for Mother's Day. It's totally fall now as I'm recording this. Um, So I had to get in there and get my nails done before the gift certificate expired. As I sat in the pedicure chair, the nail tech turned on the massage feature and showed me the control panel. I noticed that it had the option of targeting areas. And in a way, it gave me the chance to troubleshoot any soreness or specific areas of tightness in my back. So I targeted between my shoulder blades. I just started doing some rowing on a machine and my back had been really sore. So I was delighted that I was going to have this problem addressed while getting my nails done. I love multitasking. This is my first time at this nail salon and friends, they were slow. I mean, so slow. I was in that pedicure chair for an hour and a half with that kneading massage feature focused right between my shoulder blades. And today I can tell you that I'm almost bruised from that silly massage chair. My back hurts even worse. I had to ice it last night and I just, I thought to myself how this was the perfect illustration for why we shouldn't spend so much time troubleshooting our lives. It would have been just fine for me to have the chair work on my entire back, but if we put too much focus on one area, we can end up making that proverbial mountain out of a molehill. In our imaginations, we can make problems in our lives that aren't really that big of a deal. We can turn those problems into issues that hold us back from serving Jesus and his kingdom because we are waiting to fix all the things before we serve him. And we get tired, or at least I do, I get tired. Do you ever get tired of always trying to be better or do better? 
I know I do. There's always something else I should fix about myself. I used to dream of the day when I could just finally get all the things working right at the same time. You know, in terms of body image, I used to dream of when I could get my hair, my makeup, my weight, my outfit, my appearance, like if they would all be good just the same day and then get my routine perfect, not say anything too awkward or do anything awkward in front of other people. Like if all of those things would happen in the same day, I used to think that was my ideal. But alas, that's never happened, not even once. In fact, there's always something that I come away with thinking, I could have done that better. I should have done that better. And when I troubleshoot my life, I spend so much time thinking of the could haves and the should haves and the would haves that I don't get to enjoy living it. Do you troubleshoot too? Here are a couple ways that I do this personally. See if any of these sound familiar to you. First, there's the area of my appearance. Physically, I fight not to stare into the mirror at the parts that need improvement rather than finding contentment in the truth that my body, though flawed, works mostly just fine. I saw a meme a few months ago with a picture of a soldier who had lost both of his legs in Afghanistan. And the quote beside it said this, when people ask me how I can be so positive about my legs, I ask them how they can be so negative about theirs. Oh friends, this struck me hard. We are way too critical of ourselves. And in our self-criticism, we miss the big picture. We miss the opportunity to be grateful for our bodies, bodies that we can get out of beds by ourselves every day. We take things like walking for granted. I try to remind myself, and maybe you've heard me say something like this before, but God has given me physically every single thing I need to accomplish his purpose for my life. So what this means is that whatever God has planned for me, he's already given me the body to do it. Yes, I need to be a good steward of my body. There are ways that I could abuse my body that would certainly make it harder to serve God. So I do have some responsibility to take care of my body. But I don't have to stress that my legs are too short or my nose is too square for me to do what God has called me to do. All he needs from me is to be willing and able to use the body he's given me to serve him. So people always ask me, well, but what if I need to lose weight? And they say things like, I'm so consumed with my size and losing weight and how I need to get this extra weight off that it's really hard for me to think about anything else. And I get that. It is hard when you're trying to lose weight to think about anything else. But here's my response. I encourage them to get busy serving God because though losing weight's never easy, it can be easier if you are serving God while trying to lose weight. Why? Because an amazing thing happens when we start going all in to serve God. We get distracted, and I mean distracted in a good way. We realize that our appearance is not the most important thing in our lives, and we get motivated to be healthier, not for vain reasons, but because we start to experience how being healthier helps us feel better now, and how it makes it even easier for us to serve. Do not wait until you lose that 30, 50, 10, 100 pounds, whatever it is to start serving God. Engage your heart in his work. And I think you'll find that your eating habits will naturally shift a bit as you find a greater affection for Jesus and his people than maybe you have for food. So back to troubleshooting. Friend, if you are always troubleshooting your body, you're going to stay stuck and never enjoying your body. Honestly, if you're married, you've probably experienced this. You get so fixated on the parts of your body that you don't like that it interrupts your intimacy. Or maybe you avoid intimacy altogether because you don't want your husband to see that your stomach's not what it used to be. Friend, there's nothing wrong with starting an ab routine if you have the time. But don't let flabby abs or flabby whatever or whatever your body hang up is don't let that interrupt your marriage. Don't pull away from your husband because you've decided there's something wrong with you. I believe biblically that God doesn't even give us the option to decide that. He tells married couples in 1 Corinthians 7 that our bodies belong to each other. Fixating on what you need to fix physically is just Satan's trap to keep you stuck in body image bondage and it puts a burden on your marriage and it keeps you from fulfilling your purpose in him. I'll tell you about another area of my life where I tend to troubleshoot too much right after the break. Hey there, how much is freedom worth to you? That's kind of an odd question, right? When I was in the midst of my struggle with disordered eating and body image, I would have paid anything I had to be free. Truth is, I spent a lot of my budget on things I thought could help me be free, like new diets, exercise gizmos, clothing, but none of those things really helped. I'm so grateful that God showed me the way out. And now I'm passionate about helping others find their way out too. I want them to know that Jesus already paid it all. They don't have to spend another cent to find the freedom they really desire. 
But truth is, it does cost me something to get this message out, compared to who can't spread the message of Jesus' offer of freedom without the help of women like you. Would you consider making a contribution? Check out Compared to Who's Patreon page at patreon.com slash compared to who. Then prayerfully consider giving $1 or $5 a month, whatever you can to help. Any amount you'd be willing to donate would be a huge blessing and will go directly towards covering the operating expenses of this ministry. Thank you for being a part of seeing other women set free from the chains of body image and comparison. May God bless your generosity. The second area where I tend to troubleshoot my life too much is by overanalyzing my every word and action. Do you do this too? I can talk to a microphone or write a book without fretting too much over my words. But honestly, sometimes in friendships, I feel like awkward things come out of my mouth all the time and I don't even know why. Then I wonder if the other person thought that they were awkward or worse if they were offended by them. And then I spend the rest of the day or the week (laughs) or the month even stressing over why I said something so dumb. The other day I was picking up one of my children's friends and I was talking about something else but I said something like better late than never. And what I meant was that I was running late, but it came out sounding like I was saying that about her child who was still putting her shoes on. And anyway, she made a funny face and the whole thing was really awkward. And then you're in this spot where you wonder, okay, do I stop and clarify what I meant there? Or do I just let it go? hoping that they didn't notice and just roll with it. Oh, I hate it when those kind of things happen. Or just this morning, it happened again. It was so out of the blue. I was feeling anxious about a meeting I had to attend. And it's a group where I'm not really new anymore. I had friends in the room, but for some reason, nervousness just welled up within me. And I started actually trembling a little bit as I got my plate of food. Then to make matters worse, I had to get some water out of this fancy pitcher thing while holding my plate. And you guys, I was Shaking so much that I almost dropped the entire water glass, which would have been a disaster. So to avert that disaster, I used my plate of food and I caught my spilling water. And then I had to try to act totally nonchalant about the fact that all of my food was floating on my paper plate. You guys, I sat down and I ate a plate of soggy food and just pretended like nothing had ever happened because I was so embarrassed. Do you do this too? Do you spend a lot of time overanalyzing conversations you had with people, stewing in your head what you should have or could have said, or just wondering if you came out sounding totally awkward? Or do you wonder if anyone noticed that you spilled half your water on your sandwich and you ate it anyway? I do this too often. And what I'm coming to realize is that I miss out on a lot in relationships when I do this. I put so much pressure on myself to be flawless, to always communicate perfectly, that I don't give myself any grace just to be human. It's crazy how the enemy can use this to drive a wedge between people. When we feel like we always say weird things around someone, what do we tend to do? Well, we tend to avoid that person, right? Or we tend to avoid people altogether and spend way too much time alone because we're afraid that we'll be awkward around everyone. And what that leads to is depression and feeling like maybe we'd be better off without anyone in our lives, which is just a lie. God created us for community. All this troubleshooting of our words and our behaviors, it just keeps us stuck, either alone or stuck in our heads, never feeling completely comfortable and accepted in relationships. So how do you get over it? I don't think it works to just say, well, stop thinking about it or stop overanalyzing your every word. Instead, I think this is the answer. We have to stop thinking about ourselves so much. Now, that may not be the answer you expected, but it really is a cure like no other. You see, what I've come to realize is that when I spend so much time stressing and thinking about what I said wrong or what weirdo thing I did, I'm spending time thinking about a subject that always keeps me trapped. That subject is me. I get stuck in me land where my thoughts are consumed with me, me, and me. And the more time I spend in me land, in my thoughts, just like the more time I spend staring into the mirror, the more I can find that I need to fix about me. I need to stop talking so much or just smile and nod, not say anything. Or I need to stop being sarcastic or I need to learn how not to be so loud or so opinionated. All the thoughts I have in my head about how to fix me don't actually help me one bit. Now, yes, there is the Holy Spirit's conviction about certain things. And sometimes I believe we 
we feel bad after we say something because the Holy Spirit convicted us to make it right. And I've had this happen too, where I've shared something with someone without malicious intent, but something about another person just came out. And God later showed me that it was gossip. And I've had to go to that person and ask them to forgive me for saying it. But what I'm talking about here is the self-condemnation that we put ourselves through. It's a waste of time. We spend way too much time reflecting on and thinking about us. And what God wants, I believe, is for us to let it go, to turn our attentions off of ourselves and on to him and other people. I mentioned this verse a few episodes ago, but Philippians 4.8 talks about what we're supposed to be thinking about. And the list is long, but it's whatever's true, noble, just, lovely, of good report. We start spinning things in our head about ourselves that aren't any of these things. And then we wonder why we have anxiety when we go to meet people. We can literally shred ourselves to pieces through our troubleshooting and destroy our capacity to be vulnerable and to love others. If you want to stop overthinking your every conversation and every text interaction, my encouragement to you is this. When it comes to mind, stop your brain by stopping and praying for the person that you interacted with. Say, God, if I miscommunicated with them today, I am trusting you to intervene. I'm trusting you to make my intentions clear. I pray that this person will know most of all that you love them, but let them know that I love them too. Please help me to grow as a communicator of your love for them. And then leave it there. Give yourself closure with this prayer and don't go back to the mental gymnastics. Okay, one more area of life that we tend to troubleshoot, and we'll talk about it right after this break. Has body image been bogging you down for too long? It's time to get free, my friend. Go to comparetoho.me, take your free body image awareness quiz, you will learn amazing things. You'll get your results right away. And I think you'll have fun too, because I mean, who doesn't love to take quizzes? Go to compare to who.me. There's lots of great resources on that site. Articles about body image and comparison and how you can find freedom through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Check it out today, right after this episode, of course. The last area we're going to talk about today where we tend to troubleshoot our lives is in what other people think of us. And this has become so much more complicated than ever thanks to social media, hasn't it? We tend to worry too much about what other people think of us. Now, don't misunderstand me. We do need to make sure that we're honoring God in our interactions with other people, being careful not to cause others to stumble as the Bible instructs, and also being careful not to get so caught up in our freedoms that we lead others away from Christ instead of towards him. But we don't need to do is create a persona for ourselves that we feel like we have to live up to. Let me see if I can explain this in maybe a more clear way. For years, I tried to be this superwoman kind of person. I wanted you to think of me as awesome and talented and the person who could do it all. I wanted you to think I had it all together. I wanted to look like I had it all together. And if you asked me how I was, I would have said, great. But over the years, I learned that this superwoman persona actually was a lonely facade and hard to maintain. Pretending that you're perfect or almost perfect is a lot of work. I missed out on getting close to people in relationships because I wasn't willing to let my guard down. I didn't talk to anyone about the problems I had. Truth is, I almost denied having any problems at all. I remember a few years into our marriage, a counselor said to me, why do you think you're so angry? And it was the most confusing question ever because you guys, I was always smiling, always. I had told this man an earlier that hour about having a miscarriage and I smiled right through it. I told him about some other hard things, hard things from childhood, and I smiled right through it. We talked about hard stuff in our marriage and there was me still sitting there smiling. And so he stumped me with this, why are you angry accusation? I was like, I'm not angry. And he didn't argue with me necessarily, but he gently prodded on a few areas. And over the course of a month or so, I realized he was right. I was angry. I had just stuffed it so far and so deep down that even I couldn't get to it anymore. I had believed the lie that it wasn't okay for me to experience some emotions. Or that worse, if I did experience emotions like anger, then maybe others wouldn't accept me. 
There are so many ways we can try to troubleshoot our lives through perfecting our image. Maybe it's in what you post online. Maybe you carefully curate what you put on Instagram so people think of you in a certain way. I mean, let's be honest. Most of us aren't posting pictures of us that our children take with our phones. You know, the ones where they catch you without makeup on from a totally horrible angle, the one that gives you 50 chins. Okay, maybe that just happens in my house. But you're not going to see those on Facebook. I promise you, you'll never see them. I'm going to control what you see about me online. Likewise, we're careful about what we share. We probably don't get on and share our ugly. We may share causes that make us feel happy or others that make us feel angry, or we may complain about the things that frustrate us. But again, that all feeds an image we are creating of who we want the rest of the world to see us as. I'm the person who gets upset over people who talk on their cell phones and drive. Or I'm the person who gets upset when people talk about politics on Facebook. Or maybe I'm the one who has compassion for people while this person or this group of people, they don't care for others like I do. All of these things that we post can feed an image we're trying to make of who we want others to think that we are. And then we can try to maintain these images of ourselves in the groups we're in too. Maybe you're always the one with a joke. Or you're the one people always look to for advice. Or maybe you're old faithful. You're the one that everyone knows will always be there on time with the snacks no matter what. And there's nothing inherently wrong with being any of these types of people. But I think where we get enslaved is when we let these images of ourselves dictate our thoughts or actions when we determine that we have to make changes to ourselves in order to match this image we're trying to keep up with. Ah, oh, friends, we're spiraling into idolatry. So here's an example. What if you're the person in your group who is the quote unquote good mom? You're the awesome parent and everyone tells you that you are, but then your middle schooler gets into some trouble, big trouble, trouble with the law even, and now suddenly you're in a bad spot. You're the good mom. This isn't supposed to happen to the good mom. Your kids are supposed to be perfect. It's more difficult for you to appropriately deal with your son lovingly because part of what he's done is he's hurt your reputation. You take what he's done way more personally than you need to because you fear that people are going to look at you differently. You'll no longer be the good mom. No one's going to look up to you anymore. When the truth is, friend, I wonder how much more freeing it would be to the women around you even to see that even good moms have parenting challenges. Sometimes you can be the best mom around and your child may still make poor decisions. Instead of trying to protect your reputation in the whole incident, how much better would it be to be able to come together with other women and ask for their prayers and support as you deal with your son? When we're stuck troubleshooting our lives, always trying to make sure that what people think is what we want them to think of us, we get stuck trying to live up to a certain ideal. And then we can't be authentic. We don't give ourselves grace to make mistakes. And we don't give ourselves the freedom to grow. I mean, what if you're always the leader, but God's asking you to take a backseat for a little while to let others lead so he can work on a few things in you? That's going to feel hard. You may feel like part of your identity is disappearing when you're no longer the upfront or in charge person, but we have to be willing to trust Jesus with our identities to such an extreme that we don't even worry about what others will think when Jesus asks us to do radical things. One personal example of this for me was my job at the gym. I started working in gyms, teaching spinning and kickboxing classes on the side when I was in my late 20s. But a few years ago, after more than a decade of working in gyms, I felt like God asked me to stop teaching. You guys, I had fitness instructor in my author bio on my website. I saw myself as a fitness instructor. That's who I was. But one time a friend who, you know, she's sort of newbie, but not too well, but she ironically knew me from the gym. She read my bio and she asked me, why do you call yourself a fitness instructor? You only do a couple classes a week. I don't think of you that way at all. And you guys, that totally rattled me. I thought that was the image I was projecting, but here it wasn't. God asked me to quit and really let that go. And I had such a hard time. And I've shared this story on the blog before and in other places. In fact, I did a little negotiating with God when he first asked me to let the gym go. And I begged him, begged him to let me keep it. But instead, eventually I did obey. And in that, I had to let go of my gym girl identity. 
So what does this have to do with troubleshooting? Well, my point is this. We try all these things to keep up a public persona. We try to control what others know about us or what others think about us. And I think we do all of this unnecessarily. Energy spent on trying to keep others thinking well of us is energy wasted. And like we said before, it's energy that we're putting into thinking about one specific subject. Me, me, and me. I'm not thinking of how I can serve and love others well when I'm consumed with what you think of me. I'm not thinking about how I can love and serve Jesus well when I'm consumed with what you think of me. Any time I put into reputation repair or image management is time wasted. So as we close today, I want to encourage you with this truth. If you know and love Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. He sends us the Holy Spirit as a counselor, as an advisor. If there's something that he wants to tweak in us, something he wants to work on, he'll nudge us. He'll guide us and he'll lead us in that. But when we spend our time focused on bettering ourselves to meet someone else's standard, or even our own standard, we miss out on life. We miss out on freedom. We miss out on rest. We start chasing the idol of our ideal self, and we miss out on all that Jesus has for us. That's really the beauty of the gospel, isn't it? The gospel tells us that Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. All the self-improvement tactics in the world can't make us good enough for Jesus. We can keep trying and bettering and striving for perfection, but we'll never get there. We'll never be good enough for his standard of holiness. In some ways, friends, we forget this when we get caught up in self-improvement, when we troubleshoot ourselves to bits. We forget that we can't make ourselves righteous, that no amount of earthly perfecting will fill that void in our hearts. Instead, what we need to remember is that the work is already done. Jesus paid the price for us, imperfect as we are, so that we could be reunited with the Holy God. He carried us across that chasm, not from bad to better, but from completely sinful to righteous in God's eyes. I can't make enough tweaks to my life to be good enough for God, but I can rest in Jesus' arms and enjoy my life, even with my imperfect body, my awkward actions, and my uncertain reputation. I can take the focus off of myself and focus on loving him and loving others until I'm free from the treadmill of troubleshooting, and then I can find rest in him. Well, that's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening. 